Cheers and salutations. Welcome, everybody, to Hard Lens Media. We got ourselves a special interview because it's something that uh, hits close home to us. For those of you who may not be in the know, but we've been on YouTube now and doing this kind of business for seven years. And since being on YouTube, we have dealt with the censorship, suppression, shadow banning, termination, demonetization about nine times. And I, for one, despise it. Now, we all can have different opinions and perspectives and points of view, but I'm against silence. I'm against cancel culture. I'm against censorship. And unfortunately, uh, a good friend of the show, Caleb Malpin, who has done phenomenal work, has he himself also been canceled. And uh, the reason why is because he wrote a book that was available on Amazon for quite some time, only for it to be removed. And what was this book about? It was about Kamala Harris. So it's one thing for me to maybe read the review, but it's another thing altogether than introduce the person who wrote the book himself. Caleb, how are you doing? All the best to you. So I, I first, uh, I want you to at least give yourself an introduction to our viewing audience. And then number two, you wrote this book about Kamala Harris. And I think it's important for us to least go into detail the beginnings. What made you write this book? What was it about? And how long was it on Amazon for? So I want to give the floor to you. Let's get a proper introduction and beginning before we get to the whole cancel and censorship that you've been dealing with. Sure. Well, uh, I'm a journalist and political analyst. Um, I've traveled to many countries. I lead the Center for Political Innovation, uh, which does educational work and promotes anti-imperialism. Uh, I'm an American patriot. I'm a Christian. I love my country, but I do think that this global imperialist system is not good for the American people. It's not good for the world. We need a society where the needs of the people come first. Uh, and I've been living my life, uh, according to those principles, trying my best to you know, build some kind of anti-imperialist movement. Um, and four years ago, I wrote this book. Uh, the publication date was September, uh, I'm sorry, August 31st, 2020 uh, is the okay. day it was published. So it's been in print for four years. Uh, for four years, this book has been in print. It sold a few hundred copies. It got reviewed in the Morning Star in Britain. Uh, some newspapers in India ran reviews of it. Uh, it didn't get a huge amount of circulation, but I wrote it. Um, and I wrote it because I came across through my work, someone who had worked with Kamala Harris's father uh, in an academic way, uh, you know, and uh, shared with me that Kamala Harris's father was, you know, at one point, a very active communist. Uh, and I thought that was quite interesting uh, because I'm somebody who's obviously an advocate of socialism. And, and you know, I, I certainly find it interesting. And so I started doing research and one thing led to another. Uh, and I came across uh, the great research of Reason magazine about what a vicious prosecutor she was in California. And so I thought, look, there's a story there. Uh, and between the information I, I gathered from her father, from the essay he wrote, Reflections of a Jamaican Father, how he denounced her campaign, uh, to her time as a prosecutor, uh, to, to you know her connections with the Hillary Clinton State Department and all of that, I was able to put together a, a short book. It's not that long. It's 133 pages. Um, I make three political points and I use Kamala Harris to make the points. It's not a partisan hit piece. I would have gotten bored writing such a thing. Okay. It's much deeper than that. It's about American politics, what Kamala Harris really symbolizes, et cetera. So it's been on sale for four years. All good. You know, I, I couple hundred sold. I think the total I sold before uh, before uh, Monday was uh, 595 copies. So it's not selling like huge. Um, but then um, on Sunday, July 21st, um, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, it looks like she's going to be the nominee because Joe Biden steps down. And uh, on Monday, July 22nd, the media gives Kamala Harris her boost. She is the presumptive nominee of the Democrat Party. All of a sudden, Kamala Harris is getting coronated. And that's the day I get an email from Amazon uh, telling me there's an issue with the cover of the book. And I thought that was odd because, can, you know, can you can you please put the cover to the book cl close to the camera just, just so people could see it? So that's her. You know, there's a crowd of people behind her. Kamala Harris. OK. Seems as basic and benign as possible, but let's let's hear Amazon's ex explanation about why that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize, but let's. Yeah, that's that okay. Um, and uh, they gave me like multiple options. They they said they were concerned about the covers of the book, and they said, and this cover was independently designed. The name of the cover designer is on the back of the book. So okay. you know, they gave me the option of uh, having um, you know, having getting a certified letter that I had the rights to the cover from the cover designer. 
or just uploading a new cover. And I thought, I don't want to lose any time here because Kamala Harris is the, you know, is the front page. So I just uploaded a completely blank cover, uh, just using one of their templates and resubmitted the book immediately. As soon as I got that notice, Fine. I was dead, woke up the next morning, denied. And I thought that's odd. And so I applied again with the blank cover, denied. I applied again with the blank cover, denied. I applied again with the blank cover, denied. Um, and uh, every time I applied and I thought, okay, the whole reason they removed my book was the issue was the cover, but they're not letting me re-upload it with a blank cover. What was also interesting about my book uh, is generally, you know, I've been publishing with Amazon for years. And if there's an issue with one of your, one of your books, what generally happens is it stays on the site, um, but it'll just say current title currently not available. People can't order it if there's an issue, right? Um, that's not what happened with this book. It was completely scrubbed. Like it never existed. It took any, all the pages leading to it just said it had a picture of a puppy and it said, sorry, this page is not available. It's like it never existed on Amazon after being up for four years, after having multiple reviews and all that good reads still had reviews of it. Um, and you, you can still find copies of it on eBay and various places, but Amazon just completely blank. It had just, it was just completely wiped out. Um, I thought this was crazy. So I started tweeting about it. Max Blumenthal spoke up uh, on, on my behalf. Jimmy Dore spoke up. Uh, Shout out to those guys. Great. Up, great and they were just like, this is very obvious censorship. This book was fine for four years. And now all of a sudden, just so happens on the day that Kamala is being coronated and becomes the presumptive nominee, that's the day they remove it. So what happened from there? So Lulu.com is considered like the best alternative to Amazon. That's another book selling site. So I immediately just uploaded it to Lulu.com again with a blank cover and people started buying it in big numbers. Um, and I sold a few hundred on Lulu. Thursday night though, everyone starts tweeting at me that they can't buy it on Lulu. Lulu is no longer processing transactions. No, uh, no PayPal transfers will go through. Credit cards will not go through. It's up there, but they can't buy it. Uh, and I had a few friends try to buy it. Nobody could buy it on Lulu starting Thursday night. Um, and I'm just like, this is scary, right? This is not just Amazon now. It's Lulu uh, that has okay. an issue. I email Lulu. I'm like, what's going on? Uh, they, uh, they, no issue, no reply at first. Um, so I started selling it on Gumroad as a PDF. And people started buying the PDF on this website called Gumroad, where you can buy internet files. So I started selling it on Gumroad. Uh, then Monday, uh, we go through the weekend. People are buying it through the weekend, doing lots of interviews about it, et cetera. Uh, Monday, no explanation from Amazon. I just get a, a form email. Your book has been published by Amazon.com. As if nothing happened. Okay. I got a couple of questions here. So first of all, yeah. uh, what number one, I'm very sorry that you uh, went through that. It, it sounds like a process. Probably there's some differences here and there, but it sounds shockingly similar to what myself and Daniel, my colleague who co-found co -found Hard Lens Media, what we've uh, went through in regards to our fair share of censorship nine times in the ring. So uh, obviously there might be some differences here and there, but I'm sorry you went through that. But in today's modern age, especially after the 2016 election cycle, uh, people are easily emotionally triggered and identity politics clearly, you know, is, is front and center. And there's a lot of people who are easily triggered by Trump. And with this 2024 election, there is a lot of people right now suffering from a severe case of Trump derangement syndrome. So for our viewing audience, I know you already broke it down, but let's just have just one more breakdown again. In your book about Kamala Harris, you're talking about her policies. You're talking about what she's implemented about. Can you just go in a little bit detail about it? Because I think in many ways, those that lack critical thinking, and there's a lot of people lack critical thinking on the left and on the right. But for the most part, normal people just, you know, just want to be left alone. But can you just explain just again what what policies you're kind of going over in regards to Kamala Harris? Because I could see how there are social justice warriors of the social justice warrior industrial complex who would want to, let's say, cancel you. Can you just elaborate just a little bit more before we go into some more other questions? Sure. These are the facts. 2004, Kevin Cooper was just four hours away from getting the death penalty in the state of California. And the governor of California said, you know, to make sure he's actually guilty of the crime, why don't we acquire DNA evidence? Uh, Kamala Harris's office uh, stepped in and tried to block DNA evidence from being acquired. Uh, they were overruled. The execution was halted. Um, that's big, right? Why would you not want DNA evidence to make sure someone's guilty of the crime before you take their life? Uh, that's pretty big. Uh, 2010, uh, there's over a thousand cases in California that are thrown out when the courts rule that Kamala Harris violated the rights of hundreds of people 
uh, by concealing that the drug labs in the state of California uh, are turning over false positive results. People are testing uh, for drugs as part of their criminal proceedings. Uh, the result says positive that they use drugs when they did not use drugs. Um, and over a thousand cases are thrown out. Many people are released from jail. They're serving sentences uh, because of false positive results. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is blatant disregard. And, and you read the Reason Magazine reports on it. You read what the judges were saying. They said that she acted without any ethical uh, qualms. I mean, acted completely in violation of the law, did not turn over the fact that these drug labs were turning over false positive results. Uh, that's 2010. Um, uh, 2013, she's speaking at the Chicago Ideas Forum in your neck of the woods. Uh, right, she right, begins right. her... Yeah, she begins her speech by strutting around the stage going, build more schools, less jails, build more schools, less jails, and making fun of people who would like to build more schools and less jails and people that oppose mass incarceration. And she's making fun of them and she thinks it's hilarious and it's, they're, they're stupid and that, you know, and they don't explain why you need, she's got to have padlocks on their doors. And I mean, she has no love for people that oppose the police state. That's 2013. 2014, uh, she's been reelected as the California State Attorney General, and they're starting to release a lot of people from California prisons. And her office doesn't want these people to be released. And it goes forward. And on two occasions, it makes the argument that they should stay in jail because they can use their cheap labor, um, because prisoners uh, work for eight to 37 cents an hour. Uh, and if they release these prisoners, they might have to hire law abiding citizens and pay them union benefits and decent wages and all of that. And that's too expensive. God forbid, you know. So let's keep people locked up. Let's keep people in jail on the grounds that we can we can save money by doing so. Um, this is not somebody who is ethical. This is not somebody who's concerned about how their behavior impacts other people. Uh, and this is a record uh, that she is trying her hardest to obscure and cover up. They don't want to talk about this. She's trying to frame herself as Miss Black Lives Matter, as, you know, she's always been with the people, power to the people, fist bump or whatever. That's not the reality. Kamala Harris was a vicious prosecutor in California. Um, and I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You can go into the details about how she refused to prosecute the police many times when there was police misconduct in Oakland, California. Um, you can you can go into great detail to look at how Kamala Harris is just everything that those who are opposed to the police state, opposed to mass incarceration, everything that the Black Lives Matter movement was formed to oppose, that's Kamala Harris. Um, and that is something that I think her campaign doesn't want out there. I don't think they want people to acknowledge that. The other thing that's important uh, is, you know, Donald Trump uh, has pointed out that Kamala Harris, you know, she's for for almost her entire career. She's been Indian. Right. She's been the first Indian, you know, member of the Senate. She's been Indian. But all of a sudden now Kamala Harris is black. Uh, you know, she's changed her racial identity. Um, and uh, that's, you know, I think part of the reason they censored my book is that, you know, her her you know, her father is from Jamaica. Uh, he's 85 years old and he's a Marxist economist. Uh, her mother was from India. Her mother is deceased. Um, and that Kamala Harris's claim on being black is her father. And she is estranged from her father. Uh, and her father denounced her during the 2020 presidential campaign. Uh, the reason that her father denounced her is even more interesting. So 2020, Kamala Harris is running for president. She goes on a radio show, a morning talk show called The Breakfast Club. And she's on The Breakfast Club. And they asked her if she's ever smoked marijuana. Oh, and she God. Said, yeah. And she says, oh, yeah. You know, when she was in college, she loved to, you know, puff the fat daddies or whatever. You know, she loved to smoke. Uh, and so they asked her what music she was listening to. Uh, when she was smoking weed in college, and she said, "Had to be Snoop. Had to be Snoop." Well, uh, people, I think it was Tupac. I think it was Tupac. She was no. Saying. She when she said Snoop, but oh. the thing is, uh, the people have done the math. That she was not in college. I mean, when she was in college, Snoop Dogg had not yet released an album. Uh, so she was clearly lying. Uh, you know about what she was listening to. Regardless, so she says, "Had to be Snoop," and she's talking about that. So then from there. Um, they, they, you know, you know, they continue with their marijuana conversation. And she says, half my family's from Jamaica. What do you think? Uh, when saying that she smoked marijuana, uh, now her father heard that and was not thrilled. And then he came forward and he said his entire Jamaican family would like to distance himself from what they called a travesty of identity politics. And that they offered no support for her campaign. 
Uh, and they did not appreciate her invoking the stereotype of Jamaicans as pot smoking, lazy joy seekers. Um, and he wasn't thrilled. And then he wrote this essay, which I quote in the book called Reflections of a Jamaican Father, where he talks about how uh, there was a very intense custody battle uh, for Kamala Harris between him and Kamala Harris's mother. And he was not able to raise Kamala Harris and be her father because the courts played up the stereotype of uh, Jamaican men uh, as being wow. lazy, not good fathers, et cetera. And the, the language that he uses, he says, the court saw him as, quote, a Negro from the islands who might eat my daughters for breakfast. Uh, and he oh, he took that wow. he took that very, very personally um, because that stereotype had been used against him. Um, and that there's a lot written about the phenomenon of parental abduction and estrangement uh, or parental abduction and alienation where during a divorce, you know, children are used kind of as a weapon by one parent against another. And it looks a lot like Kamala Harris's mother scapegoated Kamala Harris's father, uh, made him the bad guy, so to speak, the, the, the one who was to blame for all the family's problems. She grew up hating her father. Um, and there's a lot there if you look into it. Um, and I quote Donald Harris's essay and all of that. And so you know, my book, it's interesting. People have said, why did they pull this book? You know, why did they why did they do this? I think it's a threat to Kamala Harris because she's trying to reinvent herself as black. Uh, she's trying to present herself as a champion of the downtrodden and all of that. And my book mm -hmm. goes into great detail about how that is not the case. Well, this, this all seems very shocking. And uh, look, one could one. Hold on. I, want, I don't want to get in trouble here. But one could speculate, maybe theorize until there is more evidence, even though there's some very shocking things here. But we must theorize and perhaps come up with a hypothesis of some nature or another that maybe, maybe this could have sort of been possibly through theory, a coordinated attack to silence a critical voice. But if they were so afraid, could they not come out with their own statement? I mean, you got the whole corporate media uh, industrial complex backing you up, you could eat in theory, they could just say, ah, this, this is nothing to worry about and move on. But now a spotlight has been put on this, uh, razor, uh, horrible record that Kamala Harris has had. And look, we've talked about her. We've been critical of her as have a lot of people in independent media, but anytime there is, there's always a quick, super fast rush by the social justice warrior industrial complex, which is what I'm going to call it. Uh, that would easily try and dismiss any kind of criticism of, quote unquote, the chosen one. And what I mean by this is usually, you know, we, we see this trope brought up in Hollywood, and that is, you know, using identity politics, a politician or leader or president, you know, fitting some form of another, you'd be it a black man, black woman, woman, anything of that nature, and that they're the hero and they could do no wrong. It's it's a wonderful mythology. Who doesn't love the hero, the, the mythical hero on the hilltop with the knights at, at their back? But that's just fantasy. It's fiction. It's not real, and that person never, ever existed in any form of history whatsoever. But w when you've been dealing with this wave of censorship uh, and Amazon sends you a response back saying, hey, your book is back, wh what was your first initial thought? Because then if Amazon's sending that message to you, well, then what about Lulu? What about all these other places in which you went to as a backup to sell your book? And again, it's only 133 pages long. Y y you would think that they would dismiss it. And now that it's returned back, what, what were your initial thoughts? Was there any other follow-up and have you been getting any pushback or censorship from anybody? Cause we all know how the internet rolls as soon as, you know, there's a chosen one, there's always the vote blue, no matter who sickle fans that are always quick to try and dismiss any kind of critic. I want to give the floor to you. Well, the, the removal of my book fit in with a lot of things that happened on the same day. Uh, on the same day, you couldn't search for assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Uh, they scrubbed that from Google. Uh, and uh, they also made it any search for Donald Trump immediately just came up with Kamala Harris related information, Kamala Harris criticizing Trump, et cetera. Um, and that there's a huge blowback now uh, from, uh, you know, how Google and how the tech giants, they, they seemed to be boosting Kamala Harris all of a sudden uh, in a coordinated way. 
And it seems that the removal of my book uh, was part of that. Um, so I, I'm curious if there was a conscious decision to remove my book or they just an algorithm decided to remove it. I don't know. But it seems like on that day in particular, when Kamala Harris was getting the boost, all the mainstream media were running puff pieces on Kamala Harris, which, I mean, you got to love the journalism. You should love Kamala Harris because people already do. That's a news story right there. I mean, that's I mean, it was ridiculous. You saw all the pieces, all these stories about just how everyone loves Kamala Harris. Um, I mean, just not journalism at all, just advertising uh, from CNN and MSNBC, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the, the mainstream media was pumping Kamala Harris, the social media networks, Facebook banned the picture of Donald Trump after the assassination with his fist in the air. They banned it because they said it was violent or something like that. And Facebook removed the picture. So it all care. It all happened around the same time. Um, now, uh, what I thought was interesting was that Lulu on Thursday, when people were unable to buy the book, uh, I did get a response uh, from Lulu and they said, well, too many people were buying my book. Uh, too many people were buying it and it may have jammed the system or something. Uh, I don't quite buy that because generally booksellers like to make money. Um, but Monday, Lulu started processing transactions for the book again. So you can buy it again on Lulu. So I don't know what happened with Lulu. Amazon restored it. No explanation. I just received this email, a standard form email. Your book has been published by amazon.com. I thought that was odd. They restored it um, and it's back up there, you know, blank cover, but it's back up there and all the reviews are there and people are buying it, you know, so um, and it's still on Gumroad. People are still buying the PDF file on Gumroad. I'm still selling it on Gumroad. Um, and now I'm, you know, this book, I, I've been going on many different shows and different countries around the world are writing articles about this. And this is this is getting uh, a lot of attention. So I hope people buy the book. I hope people read it, um, you know, and I hope people get something out of it. Uh, I'm quite critical of Donald Trump in the book. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I, I talk about a lot of things. I talk about Abraham Lincoln. I talk about Roosevelt, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I hope people enjoy it. And I'm glad that, that I'm able to spread some truth here in this election about who Kamala Harris really is, as opposed to the media manufactured image and uh, how we can learn about politics and the world from looking at her life story. Now, I, I think it's important for us to be critical of all politicians, be it Trump, Kamala, Biden, you name it, anybody who's part of the two party system, because let's face it, uh, no matter what, whoever sits on the throne, whoever controls the Senate or the House, you know, the top one percent always have their say. Uh, and in Chicago, the DNC convention will be here. And already there's you know talks of increased security. They're talking about making sure that certain that the trains and buses are rerouted and streets are going to be blocked off. I feel sorry for the residents, especially that live near the United Center. Um, but you are planning actually coming to Chicago. Uh, and, and for what purpose is that? I mean, can you elaborate just a little bit more about it? Because I, I think, you know, this is probably going to be a very interesting convention, maybe not on par with what we saw in 1968. However, it could be something interesting, perhaps more entertaining than the lackluster 1996 Macarena, uh, Macarena debacle. Well, this is not going to be a convention. This is just going to be a coronation. I mean, they I mean, that, you know, despite the fact no one voted for Kamala Harris in the primary, uh, they, she has all the delegates. I mean, it's, it's decided. I mean, it's it's settled that they're going to just kind of coronate her. Marion Williamson gave up her uh, challenge to Kamala Harris already, and she was the last one. Um, and what we are doing is we have printed a new edition of this book, um, and we intend to distribute a thousand copies on the streets of Chicago during the convention. Um, you know, because if this book is so important that people wanna censor it, um, you know, we are raising funds right now on GoFundMe uh, to print a thousand copies and distribute them on the streets of Chicago. Uh, so um, that's what we wanna do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been talking with a printer, a local printer here in New York. We got, you know, they're working on them already. They've started processing them and we're raising funds to get them transported. And yeah, we want to just hand them out on the streets of New York City, uh, or I'm sorry, on the streets of Chicago to anybody who would, uh, anyone who's there protesting the convention, attending the convention, who'd like to read them. Um, and so we, we've got a bulk order of a thousand and we're, I'm coming to Chicago and, uh, it looks like uh, we'll be handing them out to people on the streets of the city. So, uh, and the whole purpose of this is really just to, you know, bring more awareness to it. But um, are are you rather surprised overall just how quick corporate media is able to portray Kamala into something that she is not? Because it's 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 easy. 
it's easy for a lot of people to make a politician into this, you know, hero, this person that is, you know, a good person. But if you look into their background, it's quite clear a lot of politicians have skeletons in, in their closet. What are your initial thoughts about this uh, whole reimagining of, of who she is? And do you see any any further fallout? Because I know one thing that has to be very clear, and that is the Democratic Party wants to make sure at this convention, or as you call it, coronation, to be as clean and as uh, undisruptive as possible. Uh, for for Kamala Harris, are, are you worried about any any kind of pushback that you might get from diehard vote blue, no matter who people? Well, I mean, I I'm not planning any protests or anything like that. I mean, we're simply just going to have this book available for people. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine people would object. Maybe they don't want to get a copy or something. And yes, we are putting censored by Amazon on the cover. That's on oh, the new cover. That's already fantastic. Been fantastic. So, All right. Great. Yeah. Great. And um, yeah, but look, I think Nicholas Maduro, uh, he recently said, look, the same system that killed John F. Kennedy that tried to kill Donald Trump is trying to destabilize Venezuela. And that uh, that basically what we're up against here in this country, when we talk about deep state, we're up against a regime change apparatus. So we're up against a, a network of think tanks and foreign policy institutes uh, that represent the richest of the rich, the Rockefellers, the DuPonts, the Carnegie's, the big bankers, the oil monopolies, the tech giants, you know. And those folks uh, are very, very much committed to spreading war around the world in order to keep themselves at the top. And they're also very much committed to driving down living standards here at home. Um, these sinister visions that we hear from the World Economic Forum, you're going to own nothing and be happy about it. You're going to live in a pod. You're going to eat bugs. That's their vision. Uh, in order to keep themselves at the top, they are going to make the world poorer and poorer and poorer. They're going to wage relentless war around the world to secure their power. That's who created Kamala Harris, who selected Kamala Harris as their representative. And that is who uh, who uh, is trying to prevent Donald Trump from being reelected. And uh, I think we need to just acknowledge this as Americans. And if we love our country, uh, we don't want war. If we don't want instability and we don't want living standards to decrease, Kamala Harris is not the one for us. I talk about how we're seeing the, the rolling out of a low wage police state here in the United States. Um, and we're also inching closer to World War III. And if you're opposed to World War III and you're opposed to the low-wage police state, Kamala Harris is not the one for you. And I think people need to be confronted with that message. So, and as a final note, uh, do you, do, for anybody that's perhaps maybe dismissive of, of what's in the book, what, what do you want to say to people that might be interested in checking out? What, what do you want to say to people that perhaps – while they are suffering from Trump derangement syndrome, they're they're clearly at least open to to at least seeing another perspective. What what do you want to say to people that, well, might be hesitant of just reading this? What what are you hoping that they could at least take away from this book about Kamala Harris? Well, in the third chapter, I speak very critically of Donald Trump. Uh, this is not a partisan hit piece. This is an essay uh, in three parts about American politics, about geopolitics, about psychology, about uh, about uh, the manipulation of leftist politics by the American government and various CIA programs in which the U.S. government funneled money to leftist circles and, and et cetera. Uh, you'll learn a lot from this book about American politics and how things really stand. Uh, and uh, that's my my insights. I feel like, you know, yes, if, you, if you're looking at this book as just a partisan hit piece on Kamala Harris, uh, if you're looking for that, you'll be disappointed. And if you're expecting that, you'll be impressed because it is so much more than that. You will learn more about how our country really works and the divisions among our elite and uh, the possible future that we could have. You'll learn a lot from the book. Let me put it that way. Well, I uh, want at least want to offer this to you. When you do arrive here in Chicago, I would like to uh, speak with you on the ground. We will be covering the DNC convention. We'll be speaking to a lot of activists and organizers. Who knows if we can actually get inside? I think there's a couple people. Uh, I know do dissidents uh, when I was co-hosting with Russell uh, mentioned that at least maybe Jimmy Dore will be able to has access to get inside, which is a, a miracle upon itself. But uh, we are going to be there, and we would like to at least speak to you on the ground as we're covering the DNC convention between August 19th through the 22nd. So as always, uh, you're always welcome to be on this show. I'm very glad that at least Amazon and the other sites at least restored your account. Uh, but I am against censorship, and I am very upset with what happened to you in your book. But uh, now they gave you free press, and you know they it might might have sucked in the beginning. But now you got all this free press, and more importantly, it's a chance for people to check out your book. And there's going to 
probably a lot of protesters there that might be willing to uh, purchase and uh, read it as well. So all the best to you. As a final note, if anybody wants to follow uh, Caleb, look, I'll be posting this link uh, to uh, his uh, GoFundMe. All right, let's try and boost up those numbers so that more people see it. And plus, it's going to be updated with Censored by Amazon, which is going to be great. And if you want to follow Caleb, please be sure to follow him on X, Twitter. And that's the way you can follow all the social media links. I want to thank you so much for your time. I want to thank you so much for your time. Sorry about that. Click the wrong button there. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for your time. And to everyone else that's joining us, we will continue on with the rest of our main show. Uh, and now more than ever, uh, stand against cancel culture, stand against censorship, and let us all do we can to build a better future. Caleb, thank you again so much for your time. Sure thing. All right. All the best. Let's move on. If you fool me once, it's because I didn't think a guard was needed. If you fool me twice, it's because I didn't learn the lesson, so it bears repeating. If you try the same play three times running, it's because you know what's coming, and you didn't come to lead, you came to purposefully be misleading. Democracy is dry, it's been a century bleeding, the husk is gaping open to the sky, out in the field where all the sheep just keep on circling and worrying and bleeding. They're waiting for the shepherd that they've tried to hide their faith in, but he's so appealing. They'd gladly give their fleece at such a freeing feeling that even when he leads them to the ledge and starts to urge them on, they're positively beaming. They were told that they were on their way to save democracy, so even as they plummet, they just gloat. They don't consider screaming. And halfway up the cliff, the shepherd's cozy little mittens wrap around the staff of shattered human hopes on which he's leaning. He shows the gentle grin that used to stir your inner spark, and he says, not me, us, as he gestures to the oligarchs. He knows that if he runs, they're going to stop him like a stolen car, and he'll easily surrender because it bought a lot of time for laying mines in all the grassroots. Suddenly, the tiniest of movements gets you blown apart. Suddenly, you're in a play that's set on an election day and voting for the fire unaware you're playing Joan of Arc. Suddenly, the shepherd pulls the rug and slips a hood across your clueless mug and everything goes zero dark. I'm going to warn you once more before it's 2024 and you fuck around and find out who your heroes are. To take a step back from the herd and you'll learn that you can spot who all the shearers are. If you really want to know the product that they're selling, I can take you where the mirrors are. If you think your voice is finally ready, I can tell you where the lyrics are. I hid them in a box I had to bury neath the cobble when they carpet bombed the promenade and raided all the street bazaars. Now all we've got's the marketplace, and you're too broke to even bother asking what the options for your treatment are. Suddenly, the raw debris of homeless human dignity will find it has a hundred teeth for every badge and sweeper's arm. Suddenly, they speak in solidarity, and each is armed. Suddenly, the sheep can see the shepherd for his truest form and all pitch in at once to help him buy the farm. And now it's zero dark, and all is calm and peaceful save the distant wail of sirens that approach beside the flames of dawn. Suddenly, the carrot's just a string that's on a stick, and all your movements make you sick because the prize is gone. Now, we could go and flee into the forest low and meek, or we could exercise our right to feast and go and graze on Biden's lawn. Because he's been sowing seeds that seep a toxin out to sap a bit from each of us and keep on leeching decades after Biden's gone. So regardless who they summon out of hell to come and do the job, it will not feel like Biden's gone. But in that time of hopelessness, you cannot trust the shepherd when he once again comes asking you to humor him his siren song. And it's cute that you can innocently, honestly assume that's just a symptom of a system that was wired wrong, and not the standard feature, basic function, primary objective of a mass hypnosis firebomb. You don't need to know the words to cry along. Someday it'll hit you like an officer who pistol whipped their right along, broke his jaw and kept his job and kept it moving right along, that voting isn't red or blue or black or white or right or wrong. Voting's like a firing squad where you can choose the firearm. It's slow extinction by and large. It's Super Tuesday supercharged. It's all your futures, roots and all, just tossed out on a garbage barge. It's everybody dropping out to push the biggest oligarch. It's everybody voting fire. Registered as Joan of Arc.